Welcome to Jason Live. My name is Haley Nelson, and we are back with our STEM career series where we talk about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models in those fields. Today's STEM role model is Dr. Misha Leong. Misha is an entomologist at the California Academy of Sciences, and among other projects, she's currently studying the arthropods in homes on all seven continents. And we're going to learn all about their, our STEM role model and more when we connect with Misha in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you that today's event is live and interactive. So below this video window, you're going to see a box where you can ask questions and participate in our polls. So we're going to try and get as many of you involved in possible as possible. So listen for your name and your question. Right now, it's time to say hello to Misha. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Haley. Thanks for having me. Well, I think we should just jump right in with the basics here. What what do you do? What is an entomologist? <laughs> okay, so an entomologist is an insect scientist, and that can actually be realized in a lot of different ways. There's some insect scientists that are solving some of our agricultural pest problems. There's some who are working on pollination issues, which is something that I've worked on in the past. There's some who are medical entomologists, and they're working on how diseases get spread by mosquitoes and other insect vectors. And there's a lot of entomologists who are just trying to catalog the diversity of life. Wow. That's, that's pretty vast. So we have a question in. Let's see. Um, oh, wait, not quite yet. Oh, I'm having to actually refresh my little stream here. Mm -hmm. To get... All right. Sorry about that. We're having a little bit of a... Uh, a little bit of a technical issue there, but we are back. Can everybody hear me? Misha, are you there? Okay, good. Okay. Now, we have fourth grade class says, are you grossed out when you touch and see a bug? <laughs> um, for most bugs, no. Um, just because I think the more you work with them, the less scary and gross they get. Um, but I think that there's still, on occasion, I get, I get frightened by them. So even, even entomologists can get scared by bugs sometimes. Yeah, I, I think they're seeing a picture of you with a scorpion on your face. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was a really fun uh, fun time. Um, that scorpion is no longer alive, so it's a preserved specimen. And so it was just kind of fun to, um, you know, get to – one of my favorite things about being an entomologist at the California Academy of Sciences is we have a huge collection of, um, of insects and arachnids um, from all over the world. So it was a treat to get to have Samuel, a visiting master student from Texas, put one on my head. <laughs> it, it looks like you were having a little bit of fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a question from Mrs. Beeson's second grade class asking, where do you find bugs and where do you study them? Oh, so that's actually one of my favorite things about being an entomologist because bugs are everywhere. So it's really fun to get to travel to um, really beautiful, exotic, faraway places. But the truth is, is where I'm sitting in my apartment, I could probably grab at least one or two arthropods just because they're everywhere. And actually, on a windowsill is a really great place to find find them. But um, it's a it's a really it's a really great group to work with as a as a field biologist because you don't necessarily have to go far. Well, we have a question from another question that why is it important to study bugs? Oh, okay. So I was alluding to that a little bit um, with what an entomologist is. So I think when entomology first got started and more um, more people were just like interested in like what the natural world is and trying to document it. But around the turn of the um, 18th century, around 18 between like the late 1800s, early 1900s, is when in the United States at least we started to recognize the economic and medical importance of arthropods in spreading disease or potentially damaging our crops. And then even more recently we've started to see all the benefits that arthropods offer us through pollination um, and also being uh, biocontrol agents where they we can actually use insects to control bad insect populations. Wow. We have another question. I'll let you unpack this one. How can you tell if a certain annoying creature is an insect? Okay. Well, there are so many different kinds of insects out there that it's hard to say there's any – no. like there's always some exceptions to this rule. But in general, 
An insect has an exoskeleton. It has six pairs, six legs, so three pairs of legs. Um, if it's an adult, it'll have two pairs of wings for the most part. Um, and yeah, that, I think that's as far as I'll go for that right well, now. We've got more in depth questions here. This is from, it says, We are a K 5 gifted kids in Lakewood Ranch, Florida, and we're studying entomology right now. We learned insects are diverse and live everywhere, but we have not found out about any that live in the oceans. Do any insects live in the ocean? <laughs> That's a great question because, yeah, you would think for such a diverse group, you would have insects that live in the ocean. Now, a lot of what we like to call the insects of the sea and close relatives to insects are actually the crustaceans, so shrimp, lobster, crabs. Those are these close arthropods, uh, closely related arthropods to insects and um, that live in the ocean, and they've really kind of covered a lot of the niches that a lot of insects probably would. But there are a few um, unusual insects that we find showing up in the ocean. There's um, there's a type of uh, true bug that hangs out, like it usually hangs out in freshwater, but it's been found to be um, there's a there's a, a species that's found in salt water areas. And, you know, we're still discovering insects that live in cities, and so I would not be surprised if there's some insects that live in the ocean that we've just, or live on top or near the ocean that we just haven't heard of. And also there's insects that get blown into the ocean. They're probably not thriving there, but if you if you put, like, a sticky trap um, as you're going across the water, you'll, you'll collect some bodies that way. Well, what is the difference between, uh, I know uh, people usually say bugs when they're referring to insects. Oh. Yeah. Is there a difference between just bugs and insects? So, as when entomologists use the word uses the word bug, we're referring to a very specific type of insect, which um, the la the scientific name for that group is called the hemipterans. So we call them the true bugs. But um, bug is used so commonly um, that I think you have to be pretty uh, <laughs> like you have to understand that most of the most of the general public is using the word bug pretty synonymously with insect and spider for the most part, and so you let that go. But when we're um, speaking technically about bugs, it's just the hemipterans. All right. Well, we have a fourth grade question. Are there any bugs that you've discovered that no one else knew about? Hmm. I personally have not discovered any brand new species to science, but I've um, when I was working on my master's in San Francisco, actually in um, the Presidio, which is a park that's in San Francisco, I was finding a bunch of specimens of spiders that I couldn't not identify um, to the species level with North American field guides or North American keys, and so it was eventually um, just like this past year. Um, I found out that it's a brand new distribution of the spiders. So they're originally from Europe, and so um, some of my specimens were the first documentations of them being in um, in San Francisco. Wow, that's pretty neat. What do we have? Okay, let's see. We've got another question. This one's a double doozy. Here we go. Um, how many insects are there in the world? And how many bugs are in every house? One is from a fourth grade class. Oh. How many bugs well, so, in the house? <laughs> this is a good question. We, we were in Peru together trying to answer part of that. <laughs> yeah, so bugs in houses is, is my specialty. Um, so with, uh, with this on the floor collecting bugs with a, um, with a, a, a uh, vacuum cleaner. Oh, yeah. That was fun. That's in Peru. Um, so we. So between the actual collecting the insects and or arthropods, because in this study we're doing arthropods, so that's insects and spiders and um, and a few other arthropods that include you know millipedes, centipedes, um, isopods. So we're everything everything with an exoskeleton pretty much. Um, so with the data that we've published so far, it's been based on homes in North Carolina, and the average home in North Carolina has around a hundred. Um, different different types of arthropods in their house. As far as how many insects there are on a global scale, that's a bit more difficult to answer because there's so many that we don't even have species names for. So entomology is a, is a exciting field because there's still so much discovery-based science that needs to be done. We probably have 
I don't know. It's so ridiculous to put estimates on and, and why I have a hard time even remembering how many they are because I feel like the numbers have changed and like depending on who you're asking. It's definitely in the millions though and millions are are pretty large numbers. So <laughs> we'll leave it at that one. A lot. A lot. <laughs> we have another question coming in. Um, how do you tell if a bug is poisonous? And here's the second part of that. Can the same insect that is not poisonous become poisonous based on where it grew up? Oh, yeah. So I wonder if um, if this person is thinking about um, monarch butterflies because that's a really awesome example of um, of an insect that when it because it feeds on milkweed plants, it it's able to take up some of the um, some of the, I guess, toxins that, that milkweed plants create, and that's what makes it unpalatable, unpalatable to potential predators. So sometimes insects can pick up um, bad chemicals. Um, as far as some things be, what, which are poisonous and which are venomous. Um, so poisonous is usually when it's uh, it's something that you're you're if you're the predator and you're eating it and you just happen to it's it's not creating a good reaction whereas venomous is something that it's like deliberately injecting into you sorry that was actually way more detail than you probably needed um, that was great that was great <laughs> a lot of a lot of a lot of insects that have a, a very general rule like I said with insects there's lots of exceptions is sometimes they have um, they have what we call aposematic coloration, where they're kind of like loud looking colors, like bright reds and oranges. And the idea is kind of, um, you know, if they're not trying to camouflage, they probably have something else up their sleeve. And those might be where the poisons and the venoms might be. Um, They've got to protect what them. I should add? <laughs> oh, sorry, Haley. No, keep um, going. <laughs> one more thing that I should add to that, though, is some things cause. For, at least from a human perspective, some things might cause some people to react more than others. So I'm sure um, some of you guys know people who get mosquito bites and they get huge, huge bumps on their skin and then other people who are hanging out at the same time barely have any reaction at all. And um, and that's not necessarily what we would call a poison or venom, but it, it is like insect causing a reaction on you and it can vary based on a person's individual chemistry too. Huh. Yeah, I never think about it in the in the opposite way. Um, we have another. We have a question from CCA and from a CCA eighth grader. My words are not coming out of my mouth. Are there any insects that live in the cold? Ooh, they want to pick your brain about all sorts of insects. Oh, the cold. Yes, there are, and that was one of the most thrilling insects that I found. Um, it was probably like a few years ago, and as an entomologist, it's always really exciting when I see something and I have no idea what it was. And so I was, um, so I'm living in California, and we have the Sierra Nevadas that are a few hours away. And so I went during the winter, and I was trying my luck at cross country skiing, and I'm not very good at it, so I was moving pretty slow. And I happened to notice an insect crawling across the snow, which is um, pretty unusual to see an insect on the snow because usually. We, think, we associate insects with needing warm temperature because they're generally ectotherms and they rely on um, external heat for their energy to a certain extent. Um, but So I saw it walking across the snow, so that's cool. It was wingless, which is also really cool when you see an insect that doesn't have wings and it's obviously an adult um, because that means they've lost that character. And three, I couldn't even tell what order it is. And that's a really weird because order is like at the level of beetle, you know, true bugs, butterflies and moths. And so I was like, whoa, what is this? And it turned out that it's a scorpion fly, which is a pretty unusual order. Um, and it's uh, and it just lives on the snow. So it's like a it's a pretty unusual ad adaptation. And there, it's not the only one. There's there's other insects that live in snow fields. They've just um, taken over a lot of different areas and they have special adaptations for that. So if I had picked up the snow fly, um, the, the warmth of my hands would have been so hot it would have died. So it needs whoa. to live. Scorpion fly. That is so cool. I've never heard of one of those. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty cool looking. I recommend everyone look it up. <laughs> All right. I'm going to put it on my bucket list. We have um, oh, more questions. How do bugs tell other bugs apart, and do bugs feel pain? Oh. Well, so bugs use a lot of different senses. 
So, you know, I guess as humans, a lot of times when we're telling people apart, usually it's with our eyes, so it's a lot of visual cues. And some insects use visual cues too. There's like a cool um, study I read about um, some wasps that live in their colony, and they have slightly different markings on their face. They were able to, um, the researchers were able to manipulate with Sharpies because their faces are yellow with like a little bit different extents of black markings on their face. And they realized that the wasps were behaving slightly differently to some colony mates to, than others, and then if they changed the markings on the face, then the behavior altered a little because now they didn't recognize who that wasp was. Um, so they do use wow. visual cues to a certain extent, um, but there's also a lot of chemical cues that are going on. And so, you know, can you imagine being blindfolded and trying to identify um, your best friend based on how they smell? Like, would you be able to do that? I, I don't know that I would, but uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I want to know. <laughs> But, it, but, but chemical cues are actually really huge in the insect world, and they're so good at using smells that um, sometimes moths can find other moths from miles away. So not just moths, other insects too. They can, they can find um, species of their same type based on just like volatiles that are in the air and then hone in. And also by sound too. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard crickets chirping or... Um, other kinds of, or cicadas, or other kinds of sounds, so insects can use those cues as well. Wow. Well, uh, some fourth graders want to know how many times you've been, have you been bitten by a bug? And some eighth graders would like to know if an insect, how do you know if an insect can attack you and, how, and if it won't attack you? <laughs> well, I have to admit here that I'm a little bit of a scaredy, scaredy cat when it comes to getting bit by insects. So my my insect bite sting count, I think, is fairly lower than the average entomologist, which I, I shouldn't be proud of, actually, because I really respect and admire those like folks who just go for it. Um, I actually just read a paper written by an old-timey entomologist who was kind of just talking about all of the, you know, all of these various insects based on how much their bite stung and like what kind of reaction it caused on him. So he was just going for it for the sake of for the sake of science. Me, I try to avoid getting <laughs> so I'm always careful with the way I, I handle them. That said, I've definitely been been stung and bitten, but it wasn't usually while I was actually conducting the science. It was more just as an average person being outside. <laughs> You're not going to let a bullet ant sting you just to see? Yeah, no, Rob tried, wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Misha and I and my husband, Rob, we have all, we've all worked together um, following her seven continent study, and uh, he really was trying to get her to, uh, to get bitten on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about it. I, I think that's a good plan not to do. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I'm a wandering spider. You participated in that, so. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to catch it, but I didn't. But see, this is the problem is if, like, you know, you want to take enough risk that you're able to go for it, but sometimes I fall, like, a little bit too far on, like, the being cautious side, and then, like, it can get away, and that's the worst. It's totally worth it to get, to go and get, um, Stung as long as it's not, as long as you know that it's not going to kill you and it's just a pain thing. But you don't always know, so I'm, I'm more cautious, and I think that's okay. Well, this leads right into the next question. As you were traveling around the continents, were you ever scared of any of the insects that you encountered? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the, one, the really, really large, fast ones that I'm, I'm not sure about how, um, how toxic they could potentially be. I think is, is something worth being worried about and when we were in Peru um, there was talk about the Brazilian wandering spider being in houses um, and so you know you definitely don't want to let yourself get bit by, by something like that but you know and usually those things they might live um, live near people but they'll only bite if provoked and I would put trying to capture it and put it you know in a vial and bring it back to California is provoking it um, so but those are actually a much smaller concern of mine when I'm doing field work than um, I'm usually more worried about logistics which is less exciting <laughs> or um, when I was doing my field work in California I did um, a lot of collecting in remote areas and sometimes I was by myself and um, 
sometimes like I would have to because I was looking in urban areas that like didn't get a lot of disturbance. I was always so scared I was going to find a dead body or something like that. Um, I never did. I just watched too much of those like crime crime shows probably, <laughs> looking at all the good spots for where where a person would hide a dead body. But and just turn never... around every two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was more scared of that than the insects, definitely. Well, we have someone wondering wondering if the Brazilian wandering spider is the most venomous spider in the world. Huh. You know, I don't actually know off the top of my head. Maybe you do, Haley. You know, you, I think it's on the list. I think it's on the uh, on in one of the big lists, but I'm not sure because it, there's it's a lot of dangerous ones in Australia. Yeah, yeah. That's. And, I mean, is it something more dangerous? Like, if there's there's a there's a few species that can that are, you know, can kill a human, and so, you know, if this one will kill a human in, you know, one hour versus ten hours, like, ah, uh, like, yeah, you just don't want, you just don't fun. want any of that. But in, in the United States, um, at least in California, we, our only dangerous spider is really the black widow, and it's, I don't know how many, like, I don't think it kills many people, it just causes a lot of pain, and um, and can make people sick, and I think you guys have the brown recluse in other parts of, of yeah. parts of the country, but the U.S. we don't have that many dangerous spiders. Well, we have two more questions, and this one is related uh, with disease. It says, which disease spread by insects is the deadliest, and um, how do you identify disease-carrying bugs? Oh, okay, so uh, a lot of times when they put together these lists of the world's most dangerous animals, like, you know, people always think of, oh, a lion or something big with big teeth, um, but the world's deadliest animal is really the mosquito, and um, and that's because the mosquito can carry a lot of, um, of really awful, awful diseases from a human perspective. Um, I... I'm not a medical entomologist. I would venture that malaria is is probably one of the deadliest um, diseases that that mosquitoes spread. Um, but right now in the news, we're hearing a lot about Zika, um, dengue, chikungunya, um, West Nile virus makes makes people sick, and these are all spread by spread by mosquitoes. Um, as far as knowing whether something is a carrier or not. <sighs> I don't know of any way of telling if a, if if a if a mosquito is is carrying something because the um, the vector that it's serving as a vector for is is so microscopic and and tiny. So I don't know if there's usually any outward cues. Usually, the way um, people figure out if a region is uh, is at risk for having one of these diseases is because a bunch of mosquitoes from the region have been captured and um, tested. Um, in a lab about whether or not there's a much a very large reservoir population. Well, related to mosquitoes spreading diseases, we know that, but there's a question that says, um, how are mosquitoes helpful? How are mosquitoes helpful? Hmm, let's see. I'm sh they might be helpful to groups yeah, well, I, I know people who are mosquito biologists, and so I feel like I should not fail them on this one because they're <laughs> mosquitoes undoubtedly get get a very bad reputation because they they do spread a lot of really awful diseases that cause a lot of human suffering. Um, I mean, at the same time, you could say that they're helpful to the parasites that they're spreading because they're um, they're carrying them around and introducing them to new hosts, but that's definitely not helpful from a human perspective. Um, <laughs> there's they're they're helpful in that they provide food for other organisms that are in the ecosystem. Um, a lot, um, most mosquito babies are aquatic in their um, in their larval stage, and so they provide a lot of food for for aquatic organisms like some fish. Um, <laughs> that makes funny. sense to me. That makes that makes total sense. And, you know, mosquitoes, from a natural history perspective, all disease spreading aside, and, you know, it's really, uh, mosquitoes are such a diverse group that it's really a minority of that large group that are actually the disease vectors. And as a whole group, um, you know, when you look at them up close under a microscope, um, they're, they're beautiful in their, in their own way where they have, they, um, they, they have some really interesting biological uh, life history traits and, um, you know, for having that little mosquito-like body, they get can get some pretty colors on them. I don't know. I'm reaching a little. 
spoken <laughs> like a true insect scientist. <laughs> Mosquitoes, they're beautiful. There you go. And I, I totally agree with that. Have you ever seen Lilo and Stitch? No, I never have. <laughs> I know what the characters look like, but I've never seen it. <laughs> well, one of one of the characters in it is this, um, you know, an alien who's, you know, coming to capture, recapture Stitch, but he's actually a mosquito. Um, biologist, or he's, he's studied mosquitoes from afar, and so he's very excited to get to see them when he's on Earth, and, um, and then he gets bit by tons of them and feels great about providing them food. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, we have two questions that are biggest questions. What's the biggest bug in the world, and what are the biggest insects in the world? <laughs> well, this is actually a... Uh, um, um, a surprisingly complex question because it depends on how you're defining big because there's big as far as length and that would probably be one of these really large stick insects um, there's big as far as just overall size like it's a really dense and that's like a big beetle um, that we have in the collection it's probably like very big and round and robust and it's really hard to imagine it flying um, we have really big um, moths that have their atlas moths, and they, they have a really large wingspan, so if you're like trying to cast a shadow, that probably takes up most space. Um, yeah, so depending on how you're measuring big, it could either be a type of sick insect, a moth, or a beetle. Um, and what was, the, what was the other part of the question? It was, what's the biggest bug, what's the biggest insect? I think it was just the same, okay. the same idea. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have another one that says, is there a spider web that's stronger than the material made of Bulletproof web. Ooh, well, that you know, spider webs and spider silk is a very active field of research because material scientists are really curious about how you can have such a strong yet stretchy material. Because usually, if something stretches, it's not going to be um, super super strong, and vice versa. Um, so there are some huge webs that have been found in Madagascar that I think they're trying to study more. There's, um, I, I know that there was uh, the golden golden orb weaver, Nephila. Um, they, they were able to get the silk and, and create like a really beautiful tapestry with that. Um, it's, it's really hard. I mean, it sounds like, oh yeah, spider silk. There's spiders everywhere. We can study the silk. But when you have a, like a, a predatory animal, it's kind of difficult to keep in captivity and have enough in captivity that you can really get enough silk to study. I remember hearing a story about how they tried to create these like transgenic goats that the spider silk protein was like, you know, part of the goat. And they were like, okay, now we got the milk and now... But then it's not just the, the material itself. It's also spiders have these really complex structures called spinnerets that they use to take this like liquid silk-making material and turn it into their actual silk. And a lot of different spiders can make a lot of different kinds of silk. Sometimes they have sticky silk that they use on webs. Sometimes they have a different kind of silk that they use to wrap their eggs in. Um, they have other kinds of silk that they use when they're um, just exploring the ter their territory. And so they have like these little drag lines so in case they fall. They spiders don't have wings, so if they fall over an edge, it's kind of nice to have a little drag line to <laughs> climb themselves, climb back up by. So they, they make a lot of different kinds of silk, too, and we're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> Man, that is so cool. There are just so many interesting things about every arachnid, every bug, every insect. I mean, you could just keep going on and on. Well, um, we have another, oh, Mrs. Beesom's class. They eked another one in here. Are we losing all of our bees? Oh, that's that's a good question. So bees are near and dear to my heart because I was I worked on them for six years, um, mostly California bees. And a lot of times when we're when we're worried about our our bee populations, it's usually our honeybees. And honeybees are just one species, or European honeybees. Apis mellifera is just one species of. Um, at least in California, we have 1,600 species. In the United States, we have 4,000, spe around 4,000 species. And I have to say estimated because we don't even know all of our bee species <laughs> still. And so as far as being able to say whether or not their populations are declining, um, because there's a lot of species that we don't even have names for, it's hard to even know, like, what's the baseline? What did they used to be? And sometimes colonies are doing better one year than others. Um, there's 
there's a lot of bees that don't aren't even social, so they don't even have hives that we can monitor year to year. Um, as far as honeybee hives, there was a period when um, beekeepers were noticing that um, that their their bees were leaving their hives and not coming back, and that's what you might have heard of uh, colony collapse disorder. Mm -hmm. um, but there's like a lot of there's a lot of different reports. Like some parts of the country are doing better than others. Some of the causes are different in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. Um, but what's good is that people are starting to recognize that honeybees are really important for humans because of the pollination services they provide. And so we're at least starting to look at them more and figure out what's going on with them. Yeah, we plant for bees for in, in our yard just because we want to make sure that they're there. But let's shift a little bit and talk about how you got to be where you are today. And we have a question right away from a uh, home school. They're wondering, have you always loved insects, even when you were young? Uh, yeah, so I was lucky enough. I, so I grew up in Oakland, California. Um, and even though that's even though we, uh, I was lucky enough that we had like, a little backyard. And I remember really liking going outside and um, looking under stones or even in houses, you know, you can see ant trails going inside sometimes at different times of the year. And I just remember really liking to watch them and trying to figure out what's going on with them. Um, but then I found that as I got older, like, um, you know, once I hit middle school or so, it was less of a, less important to me, I guess, to look at the insects. There were bigger things going on in my life <laughs> than, than the insects in my backyard. Um, and I got interested in a lot of other things. I have, I've had, I've, I've always liked the idea of being a scientist, but I I liked my history and my English classes, and I really liked playing basketball. And um, and I remember when I was in high school, I had a computer science teacher, and I remember telling him, "Hey, I saw this book on entomology. I think that could be a cool area to go into." And he was like, "He was a computer science teacher," and he was like, "Entomologists are super weird. Don't do it." <laughs> and so I got so I was like, "Ooh." He's saying that. Ooh, what does that mean about entomologists? Um, and so when I, so I kind of put it out of my head, but was still kind of like, kind of like, oh, they're kind of cool, but I didn't really know very much about them. And it wasn't until I was in college that I got to do a study abroad course in um, Costa Rica, and that I, I met another entomologist there. And the insects in Costa Rica are just amazing. And um, this woman, Patty Ortiz, was like just so enthusiastic and so helpful and like telling me about all of the things that are going on and I just remember lamenting to her that I wish that we had that kind of stuff happening in California because I would love to keep working on these closer to home and she was like you do have these in California and so when I came back to the US I um, was sort of re-energized to start looking at California insects and um, learning as much about them as I could and I really haven't looked back since. Well how long have you been an entomologist? That's our, our next question. Okay, so I guess if you start, it's hard to say when you when when you really start because like I've loved them since I was a little little girl, so that would be decades. <laughs> um, but I guess I I took my first entomology class in the fall of two thousand three, so thirteen years. <laughs> I've been studying. Well, we entomology. have another question that says, "How long did it take you to get your doctorate degree?" Oh, all right. So um, I, w I got my doctorate at UC Berkeley, and I was there from 2008 to 2015. So around, even though that sounds like seven years, it was like six years because <laughs> it was the fall, fall, yeah. Am I not doing the math right at all? <laughs> but I got there in the fall of 2008, <laughs> and, then, and I finished in 2015. So I was there for six years. Um, I, I had done a master's beforehand, and I spent two years doing that. And then before that, I had been college. For, I did an undergrad for four years. So I really liked school. Um, <laughs> but, you know, school changes a lot um, at, at different levels. And so, you know, in high school, and in junior high school, it's a lot of um, a lot of ac activities, or like doing doing what the or learning about what the teacher is telling me about what how the world works. And as I moved up, it was I realized, wow, I'm one of the few people in the world who know about this, and and really getting to push forward the frontiers about what what we as society know about something, and that's so exciting. And so I really I really loved that aspect of it. 
Well, we have another question coming in. It says, you've been around the world. What's your favorite place to find bugs? Mm. Well, I think um, in, the, in the tropics is, is, I think that's where I got first excited about them. Um, and because I don't live in the tropics, whenever I go, it's always like a much higher ratio of new stuff, and so that's always very exciting. Um, but I, I, I gotta be honest, last year Sweden was awesome. <laughs> I, I had never thought about going to Sweden before, and then because of this project and Haley, you're in Rob's connection to Sweden, I, I, that's, where, that's where we went, and I really loved it. So I think that because insects are everywhere, you just never know where, where, where you're going to have these really fun experiences and, and find really cool things. Yeah, I loved that video, and I loved, it seemed like the relationship was, the relationship between bugs and people um, was really interesting there. People thought yeah. a lot about it, it seemed. <laughs> well, we're yeah. going to take a break. We're going to take just a little break uh, from asking you questions, and now we're going to flip it, and we're going to ask, we're going to ask the students questions about you. Misha has questions for you. Where, where our first question is, which language other than English can Misha speak fluently? Is it A, Cantonese, B, French, C, Russian, or D, Japanese? Hmm, let's see. We have people submitting right away. Um, oh, let's see. All right, it's leaning. Right now it's leaning 50-50 Japanese, Cantonese. Oh, okay. I don't know what other language you speak, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, Cantonese and Japanese are really good guesses because my great-grandparents, um, who were the ones who immigrated to the U.S., are from China, Japan, and Korea. So I have um, those backgrounds. But the problem is that it was so long ago, and because they're from different countries, um, they couldn't speak those at home. So none of those Asian languages got passed on to me, <laughs> um, which is a huge bummer because I wish I could. Um, and then my name is Russian, actually, Misha. It's Russian for bear. <laughs> Um, but I don't speak Russian. Nobody in my family speaks Russian. I actually speak French because my husband is from France. I did not know that. That is so cool. <laughs> Do you go? So we, we need to collect in France. <laughs> maybe maybe we will. French too. That would be great. Okay. There we go. Do it. <laughs> we go. Let's clip right through. Here's Misha's next question for you is, how many species of bees are there? Estimated to be worldwide. Don't tell him, Misha. <laughs> I think I already did. <laughs> oh, well, let's see who who was, was who was attention. in there. Let's see. We've got fifty percent are saying oh no, we're shifting here. We have it's split thirty three percent with two thousand two hundred and twenty thousand. Species. Okay, the correct answer is 20,000 species of bees worldwide. <laughs> Woohoo! And, and when you say there are about, how many are there in the U.S.? About 4,000? Uh, there's about 4,000 in the U.S., and in California we have about 1,600. That's a huge number of bee species. Because yeah. you can't see them. There's like the honeybee, and there's like a bunch of different species of bumblebees, and then a bunch of insects that when I show people, they don't even realize that they're bees. Oh, I actually have some bees right here if you want to see one. Oh, yeah, we want to see bees. Okay, this is actually the, the showstopper. Like, people are always really surprised that this is a bee. Can you see it? It's green. It's people don't usually green. expect bees to be green. And shiny. So, yeah, so it's a sweat bee. We call it the ultra green sweat bee, or Agapostomin texanus. And so we have these really beautiful shiny green bees that are found, at least in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, they're actually really cool because you can tell the males and females apart really easily. And because male bees can't sting you, because a stinger is just a modified egg-laying device, you can hold the male bees without any fear of being stung. Wow. I'm going to follow the sweat bee. <laughs> yeah, sweat bees. Awesome. I'm going to go hold one next time. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go to the next poll. This is your last question. Um, what are some important entomological tools that Nisha carries in the field? A. Vials, notebook, aspirator, and net. B, microscope, pins, 
spreading board, C, binoculars, walkie-talkie, and computer, or D, gas mask, fire retardant clothes, and goggles. All right, let's see what they have to say here. We've got, oh, a lot of people are saying, we've got 83 at A, and for C, I think, or for microscope pins, we've got 17%. Okay. I know they have a good one. <laughs> yeah, you guys got this one right, completely right for the most part. So the keyword was in the field. So I definitely use microscopes and pins, but that's usually in the lab. And a computer is really important in the lab too. And actually, sometimes I like carrying around binoculars. And if I was doing more remote field work, a walkie-talkie would come in handy. But because I'm usually working in urban landscapes, I really just need the basics. And a notebook to keep notes in, an aspirator, which looks like this which is, it can come in different varieties, but mine is just a simple tube, and I can put, I can like grab the insect on this end, and I suck up, so that it creates a vacuum, and then there's, don't worry, there's like a tiny little um, mesh screening in there, so I don't suck the insect inside, but it just gets trapped in the tube, and I'm able to put it in a vial, and then this is my favorite net to use, because it's very discreet, it's quite tiny, and then it collapses down into something tiny, so I can carry it around in my bag. It's adorable. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Um, uh, what was I gonna? Oh, I was gonna ask you something else. It slipped my mind. So let's get back to these questions okay. here. We have one comment that's, "Wow, that's so cool!" from Phoenix. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I bet that's referring to the the bee. Um, <laughs> and then we have another question that says, "Hi, we're planting a butterfly garden tomorrow. Can you tell oh. us why butterflies are, are important to our ecosystem?" and what other insects may be attracted to our garden. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for doing that. I'm sure the butterflies and other insects will appreciate it. Um, so butterflies are important because, like bees, they can also be pollinators. So a lot of um, insect groups, and not just insects, but pretty much any animal that visits flowers can, while they're picking out in the flower and getting um, the nectar that they're after, the flower often is able to rub some pollen on its face and then when that animal moves to the next flower some of that pollen rubs off and that's how the, um, the, fla the, the plants are able to cross pollinate so uh, butterflies can be valuable vectors or I guess I should we use the vectors for that they can be val valuable agents in, in carrying pollen from um, one plant to another and you can actually probably Google image search uh, butterfly pollination and you see these butterfly faces close up and little pollen stuck on their tongues which is pretty cute. Aww. We have a question. Where did you get that net? Where did you oh. get the I do? <laughs> I, uh, so I wonder, so this is, I don't know if it's mostly California biologists who use this but there's a company called BioQuip. B-I-O-Q-U-I-P. If they want to give me a discount. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they have all sorts of great entomological tools, um, sort of like a one-stop shop for like pretty much anything you want to want to get. You can buy vials there and forceps and like sometimes I just yeah just like to go on little. Some people like to go on shopping sprees at clothing shops. So I like to go on shopping sprees at this insect catalog store. But you can That's also make insect collecting amazing. tools too. Um, something that was actually my my biggest. Um, my biggest weapon or tool in my arsenal for um, figuring out uh, what bees were found in urban and agricultural and natural landscapes, one of the tools I used was called pan chopping. And so pan chopping, you just take um, an otherwise, you know, just like a plastic bowl and just fill it with a little bit of water and maybe a little bit of detergent. Blue Dawn is the choice detergent of bee biologists. And you just <laughs> put it out, put it outside on a sunny day. and um, Insects that are looking for um, flowers to pollinate will come investigate, and they'll they'll land in your in your bee bowl, and you'll be able to get an idea of who's flying through your landscape. And sometimes you can spray paint them other colors. So I usually use white, a fluorescent blue spray paint, and a fluorescent yellow, and I just deploy these all around the landscape. And I'm trying to get an idea of what's down there. I want to do that. Is that is, would it be harmful to do that in our own yard? Would that like take too many bees away from the environment? Just to know uh, who you're feeding, or yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think that it's. Uh, it is one of these methods where it's not a catch and release. So if a if an insect does find its way into your bee bowl, unless you find it right away when it's just like sort of still swimming around, then you can still usually rescue it. But a lot of times the insects um, 
drown in the bee bowl, and then you prepare them up as specimens. But I think it's important to um, recognize that there are there are a lot of insects out there, and sometimes um, in order to learn more about their biology and for um, for people to just get a better idea of what's found in their neighborhood, I think it's I think it's a legitimate legitimate use of, of, of their of their little lives <laughs> because um, they usually their lives are not spent completely flying. For a bee, most of its life is actually spent underground where it hatches and it eats this little pollen ball that its mother created for it and then it grows into a lar uh, it eventually pupates and then it um, becomes an adult and then it usually only flies as an adult for a few weeks. So most wow. of its life was spent elsewhere. Huh. Well, a bee, another bee-related question. What are some recommended ways to improve honeybee numbers? And this is coming from an eighth-grade science teacher, so maybe they're thinking to improve honeybee numbers okay. uh, maybe at their school. Oh, well, you know, so I, I don't specialize in, in honeybees, and there's so much that's known about honeybee biology, so I don't want to get anything too wrong there. But well, something that I, I do know about honeybees, uh, or honeybee people, <laughs> is that they, they like to create um, societies, and there's these, like, honeybee, like, in the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's at least five honeybee keeper groups. And I've gone to a few of their meetings, and um, they there's just such a wealth of information that these people have who are honeybee hobbyists. And so if there's any honeybee group near you, they probably have the best advice on what's happening in that particular region, what kind of tips uh, they have, because uh, and, and they're usually really excited and happy um, mentor to mentor um, anybody who's starting out with beekeeping. So I recommend checking out your local beekeeper group. Cool. I wonder. I know we have one here, but I've never, I've never done that. Maybe I'll hook up with our beekeepers. They usually have free okay. honey meetings too. Ooh, free honey <laughs> even better. <laughs> well, we have another very interesting question. It's a hypothetical: If a poisonous insect eats another poisonous insect, what will happen? <laughs> oh, let's see if I can think of any real-world examples. Um, well, if the poisonous insect that's eating the other poisonous insect, it's, it's poison isn't going to do anything for the insect that it's eating. Well, I guess that maybe it captured the other insect because it was able to, um, introduce some venom to it. And so that's how, so there's some, there's some, um, one of my favorite groups of wasps are called uh, Pompilidae, or they're the, uh, they're spider, spider wasps. And what they'll do is, they want to um, find a nice juicy spider for, or the, the mothers want to find a nice juicy spider to lay her eggs on. And so she'll find a great spider, paralyze it by envenomating it, and then drag it back to her, um, back to her, her burrow, and then lay her eggs on it so that when her babies hatch, they have fresh meat to be consuming. And mm. so this is the case of a, of a wasp that's able to have some kind of venom that, or sting that, um, that, paralyzes the spider, but at the same time, most spiders have some sort of venom because that's how they use to hunt. Um, so in this case, the the spite, the the, uh, the poisonous um, individual that was hunting the other one won, but I know that there's probably other cases where um, if something is very toxic, like let's say one of these monarch butterfly caterpillars that's been eating a lot of milkweed, um, if something else tries to eat it, then then maybe, I don't know, I think monarch butterflies, it's not that powerful. It kind of tastes bad. I don't know if it kills anybody. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somewhere, I'm sure somewhere, some monarch butterfly has managed to kill something. <laughs> All right. I'm going to throw you for a loop here. Okay. Expose you here. Have you ever eaten a bug? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I bet everybody watching this has too. <laughs> there, I mean, there's so many tiny bug parts that just make our, their way into our food system. Even if we are very careful and there are definitely regulations out there, the regulations are not on zero insects being sold in your salad. It's like less than this bad threshold. So anybody who's eaten fresh produce, I mean, I don't want people to stop eating fresh produce because that's important. But there's always something little 
in there. Um, I mean, you look at you. Who are you, who are you to talk? Not you, Haley, in particular, but the general <laughs> you. I mean, you you have arthropods living in your pores on your face, so it's very hip difficult to to not actually ingest any any arthropods ever. I have deliberately eaten them though, <laughs> too. Um, so I went to a wedding. Um, in Cambodia. Okay. I don't know where this is going. This is great. Keep going. <laughs> to a wedding. A wedding in Cambodia. And um, actually eating insects is, is a part of the regular diet there. And so some of the dishes had insects in them. And I was like, oh, I'll try it because they're prepared in a way by people who regularly eat them, prepare them. And it was actually, I really liked this one dish that had um, ants in it because it was sort of peppery. The ants were peppery? Yeah. Wait, were sorry, I have to say Okay, no, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, no sneeze. Okay. Uh, feel free to sneeze whenever you need to. We've, we've both got a cold, so. <laughs> yeah, they were a little they were a little peppery and it was quite good. A little bit of crunch. Mm, okay. I'm gonna I I would definitely try that. Bless you. Sorry, that was a <laughs> <You're good tight. laughs> All right. Well, let's um, let's keep going here. Oh, Garfield Elementary. They were they're wondering about when you studied insects when you were young again. Um, did your mother help you study about insects? Um, I don't think my mom doesn't really know a lot about insects, but that's okay. Um, what was probably the most helpful is that she didn't discourage it. So she, you know, she probably was like, "Ew, that's gross," but um, never never said. Misha, you can't do that, and I and I, I really appreciate that she never did that. And so she helped me in the way she could. She let me use um, some empty jars. And I was able to create little habitats that way. Actually, I didn't um, throw out there that when I was younger, I not only did I like insects, but um, I also really liked, um, you know, I probably liked all animals, but besides having cold, I have allergies to a lot of um <laughs> To a lot of mammals <laughs> and a lot of furry, because I think it's because of the the dander. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to have like a either a tarantula or a snake or some kind of frog as a, as a pet because I couldn't have something really cute and cuddly and fuzzy. And my mom was like, she put her foot down at the snake. She didn't really want me to get that, but she put, I was like, so tarantula. And so I I got to get a pet tarantula for my um for my eighth birthday, and um. I think keeping that, I think, taught me a lot about the biology of, of the spider. I wrote a big report on it for school. And, you know, for my mom to let me have a pet tarantula, I think, was was very brave of her. Brave and supportive. That's nice. Yeah. We have a, a comment from Gavin Kids. If mosquitoes negatively impact the world through disease, why don't we just eradicate them altogether? <laughs> we have tried. So there have definitely been efforts to eradicate them, um, it's really hard to selectively eradicate species, though, because, you know, on the one hand, you could just, like, spray everywhere, but then you're probably going to be killing some other things inadvertently along with the mosquitoes. Um, and also, the, the methods that we use now are probably less effective um, than we used previously because now we understand all of the health consequences <laughs> of spraying in places where people live. Because even if something is targeted towards a particular insect group, sometimes it can have effects on humans as well. And because we don't want to, we don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to hurt people. At the same time, um, some of the methods that we use have had to change over time. And because there's really quick generation times of, of pest groups, sometimes those um, those insects are able to adapt, and they're let, they're more resistant to the tools that we used to use against them. Um, but given that, uh, we have managed to keep populations really low in certain parts of the country, and a lot of um, urban areas don't have nearly as many um, mosquitoes as they probably used to have because of really intensive spraying efforts that happened beforehand. We're going to jump right in because there are there are three questions here that are what's your favorite bug to study and why? What's okay. just your favorite bug? And what's the friendliest bug in the world? Ooh, okay. So my favorite bug to study right now um cuz it changes a lot. Like I I really I really love bees and like as soon as I learn about a new group, I like want to learn as much as I can about that. So recently I got really excited learning about um 
kissing bugs, which are a blood-sucking group of assassin bugs. <laughs> and um, I was I was getting to read a lot about the history of of um, Americans and kissing bugs and like what we used to call kissing bugs, what we call them now, and how they can cause diseases, but at the same time, um, actually sometimes almost like spiders, they get a much more bad reputation than they probably deserve. And so that was a really fun group to learn a lot about. Um, the friendliest bug? Or what was the one before friendliest bug? What is your favorite bug? So that one was, it was a favorite bug to study um, and why. And then there's what's your, favorite, your bug. favorite bug. My favorite bugs, I think, are still the bees. Um, I think that there's just such a sweet spot of, they're, a lot of them are really cute because they're kind of chubby, like the bombiform, round bum, bumblebees. So I think chubby, chubby insects are always really cute, probably because that's like human, you know, people love chubby little babies, like chubby little insects. Um, and, you know, <laughs> and and it's nice because they, they they provide such beneficial services for humans. A lot of our food system um, relies on on the pollination services that they provide, and so I appreciate appreciate that. So I like I like bees. Um, and then as far as the friendliest insect out there, um, let's see. It's probably going to be one that doesn't sting. Um, and likes to come near people, so kind of like the American Robin of of insects. Um, you probably would. I, maybe people wouldn't agree with this, but I, I think like uh, some flies are pretty friendly. They like to hang out, <laughs> hang out, <laughs> and say hello, like surfing flies. We might not like it, but they like hanging out with us. So they are friendly. Like yeah. It was not which ones that we want to make friends with. It's just which are the friendly. <laughs> yeah, friendly. They're trying. <laughs> Yes, yeah, really persistent. <laughs> they really want to be friends. Um, well, uh, before before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, to tell the students? Um. Well, I you know thanks for listening. All about me talking about insects. Um, even I, I don't expect every single person listening to eventually become an entomologist. <laughs> But you know, e like even if you don't become an entomologist, I hope you can um, keep your eyes open and be a little less fearful of of the insects that are in your daily lives, and um, and and start to think about all of these these cool things that they're doing right under right under your nose. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, Misha, we are all out of time. Thank you so much for coming today and sharing your story. We really, really enjoyed it. If I have any bug questions ever, any insect questions, I'm coming to you. Oh, absolutely. I love that, Haley. <laughs> <laughs> well, our next event will be on April 28th at 1 p.m. featuring STEM role model and ecologist. Stephanie Shuttler, and we'll talk to her about her citizen science, camera trapping, mammal behavior, and ecology. But until then, for Jason Learning, I'm Haley Nelson. We'll see you next time on Jason Live.